Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are performer Gwendolyn Yeo and director Michael Altman. Actress performer Gwendolyn Yeo was born in Singapore, where she went to Catholic schools. Then she moved to San Francisco and attended St. Ignatius College Prep. She received a Bachelor of Arts from UCLA and a Diploma in Classical Piano from the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. And it looks like, with all that schooling in, in Singapore, it paid off because you finished UCLA really early. <laughs> <laughs> but why aren't you giving us a recital? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I started out as a musician, but uh, I used to, but my, my first love is acting. But if you really put it all together almost as a hyphenate, I think a performer includes musicianship or comedianship or yeah. writing. It's just as long as you're expressing and developing in that way, I think it's great, yeah. But so why did you train in music? Uh, my parents made me. <laughs> Were they musical? No, not at all. It's an Asian thing. With, it, it is an Asian thing, yeah. isn't it? You've seen but, Joy Luck Club, right? But not, but not drama. No, drama is no. not an Asian thing. No, when I said artist, they said autist, autistic. I was like, no, I'm not doing anything autistic. I said artistic. No, it's a very, it's, in, in, that's what the show really is about, laughing my mouth wide open. It really is about, um, you know, the, the differences between Asian values and American values. So in Asia, it's 4.0 GPA, and you play the piano, you play the violin. So we were sort of... <laughs> I mean, go to med school. <laughs> go to med school, be a lawyer, those are your two choices. So we moved to the States, the United States. I mean, I, I, opportunities sort of opened up. And uh, so they, they approved of the zither. They didn't quite approve of the drama. The zither. I thought maybe you'd bring the zither, but is it heavy? It's just a pain in the butt to schlep everywhere. Is it? It's, is it big? It's about five feet long and, uh, and uh, two feet wide and about oh, so four it's feet. Pretty big. Oh, it's huge. Oh, it so fit in my sit, car. Do you sit underneath it? You know, it, sit on, it sits on stands like a table, yeah, so and then you play it like this. And yeah. did you play that in Singapore? No. Oh, you didn't start that till you were in the United States. That's right. That's right. Why zither? Oh, it's very Asian too, isn't it? No, you know, and you'll see why in the show. <laughs> but, I mean, to be honest with you, actually my brother, um, my brother, he's going to kill me if I tell the story, but he kind of... He kind of liked this uh, girl who played it, and then I checked it out, and I was like, I like that. I can play that. Oh, so you just picked it up yourself? I picked it up myself, It wasn't yeah. a family thing? No. Oh, I, oh. I played the piano. I went to the Conservatory of Music in San Francisco for piano, but I hated the piano. You know, it's like you can't do better than Mozart or Beethoven, but with a Chinese zither, I thought I could put my own sort of American spin to it. Uh -huh. So it felt a lot more pioneering and unique. But and was it hard to learn? Oh no, maybe when you already knew the piano. I'm pretty good, yeah. Once you have uh, sort of finger dexterity, you, you do pretty all right. Well, did you take drama classes? No. In San Francisco? No? I'm a total hack. Mm -mm. Oh. I learned on my feet. No drama training? Uh, I learned on my feet. <laughs> <laughs> no training whatsoever and action. No, I, uh, I, I graduated from UCLA with a, with a bachelor's and then I just, I won the Miss Chinatown USA pageant, Miss Asia America. And uh, I traveled and I did... Wait a minute, let's go back. You won these beauty pageants. Mm -hmm. Did you play the zither in them? I did. You did, I because did. they wanted to see your talent. That's right. Probably, it didn't hurt. Was it easier to bring the zither than a piano, or did they have a piano there like, for you? Know, you? you don't really have zithers just lying around. <laughs> oh, you know no, what so I you mean? had to bring it, right? Yeah, you, you can't open a Neiman Marcus catalog and buy a zither, but you can, <laughs> you can go and rent a piano. So, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a schlep, but I, I had a, fun, a lot of fun doing it. So that was one of my questions. What were you doing leading up to this laughing with my mouth wide open performance and, and uh, acting and all that? What were you doing? You didn't take drama lessons. You were taking piano lessons. What else were you doing? Well, after I graduated from UCLA and I won Miss Chinatown USA, I got a commercial agent. And then from um. there, I sort of got into uh, TV and voiceover work. So 
Most people know me from Desperate Housewives. I did two seasons right. on there, and I was not, uh, submitted for an Emmy nomination. And I did Broken Trail with Robert Duvall and Thomas Hayden Church, which won a ton of Emmys as well. But with no training? I wouldn't say no training. You know, I, I will say that, you know, some people who've gone to Carnegie Mellon or Yale or what have you, I mean, some of them work a lot, some of them don't. But when yeah. you get on the set, do you feel comfortable? That's yeah. what I think more than anything. Yeah. Is what your training's supposed to provide, right? Comfort you know, zone? I don't know. You know, I feel like I learn on my feet. And I, I think that, you know, I feel like the Singapore way was if you study a certain amount of years, that's the payoff. And the acting bu business is not like that. No. Yeah, it's not like that at all. So, so you have done a lot of TV work in between before getting to this. Why yeah. does somebody do a one-woman show? <sighs> um, that's a good question. Well, one of which is, I think, as, from the pure business standpoint of it, I think when you're not uh, a child actor and to sort of further your, your career and, and to, to garner heat, it ta you, you have to sort of you know, grab the bull by its horns and create and step outside of a lot, uh, you know, waiting for the business to give you an opportunity. That's from the business side of it. In terms of the performer side of it, and this is much more important, I, um, I just felt there was a lot of need to work out familial issues. Oh, I was going to ask you yeah, about that next. Yeah. Is your family depicted mm. in this? Yeah. Well, how do you work it out? Do they come to watch you and they no. go like, we can't talk to each other, so I'm doing it on stage, right? It's a good point. I mean, it's semi-autobiographical. It's inspired by true events, so it's not exactly, oh, it's, it's not a documentary film. <laughs> it's a show. It's entertaining. Um, but I did, you know, uh -huh. it was very moving because I spoke to my, my dad and my mom, and I said, look, I'm doing the show, and I want you guys to be okay with it, but I can't have you come yet. It's going to make me very uncomfortable. Oh. And, it, and uh, they said, okay. They said, okay. One of the things that you do attack in the show are these cultural differences yeah. between America and uh, Singapore. Yeah. Uh, Asia, yeah. probably, all of Asia. Mm. Because you were old enough to understand what those cultural differences are, and they follow you, don't they? Yeah. Everywhere you go. Yeah, yeah. I think when I, <laughs> you know, moment to moment, I'm Asian. Moment to moment, I'm American. So if you came over to my house, I would say, take off your shoes. Uh -huh. You know, that's, you know, and when someone doesn't, it, ooh, my blood starts to boil. Oh, it really yeah, does? Yeah, yeah. It would be, people, is, people don't get it, you know. But on the other hand, you know, I also love that people, I mean, the title of the show is Laughing with My Mouth Wide Open, that people can laugh and throw their heads back. And, and, Which and, you wouldn't do. Well, in Asia, it's more, it's more polite to cover your mouth when you laugh, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, th that's one cultural difference, you know. Or in Singapore, um, I can't be the representative for, for the whole of Asia, but at least in Singapore, when someone gives you a compliment in Singapore, you go, oh, no, 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 no. So that's a great suit. You, be, you, you know, Joan, you'd say oh, thank, thank you. Oh, thank you. Right, in Singapore, <laughs> tell, tell me you like my dress. Oh, your dress is so cute. Oh, it's very old. <laughs> Just, you bought it for today, yeah. but it's very old. Yeah, it's very, very old. Yeah, you know, uh, so it's that you, it's, it's a different, it's, 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 it's a bit pompous to accept compliments, but in um, American culture, it's it's a joy to share that compliment. Right. You know, so stuff like that. Yeah. What else? Tell me, um, this beauty pageant thing, is that Asian? Yes, I did. All the pageants oh, I did were, were Chinese based. Oh, they were? Yeah. Well, Miss Asia America was all, was all, but, but the biggest one I won was Miss Chinatown USA, so I competed against Miss Chinatown Seattle, Miss Chinatown LA, Miss Chinatown oh. New York, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Oh, so it was a, a part of that. Did you have to train for your oh beauty Oh my God, pageant? yes. And you did? And there's a scene in the show. You gonna, are you going to come to the of show? Of course I'm going to say it. Okay, all right. Uh, we'll get a couple of free tickets for you. <laughs> oh yeah, good. You and Henry. I'll bring my friend. <laughs> I'll bring all my friends. You better show up. No, um, yeah, you know. They, they and where is it? Oh, where am the, I showing up? It's at the El Centro Theater oh, El Centro, in, in Hollywood. Right. And if you want, want to purchase tickets, it's brownpapertickets.com. Oh, good. And you plug in laughing with my mouth wide open. Which is the name ha, of your ha, show? Ha, 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 brownpapertickets.com. And think of it as a brown paper bag, brown paper tickets. Yeah, yes. I like it. The you El like Centro, it? yeah, it's, I like it. It's a whopping 45-seat theater. Which is great. <laughs> But you, but you touch every one of those 45 people. You really do. Because you're right on them, oh, right? Oh, man. I, mean, I, I can see why you wouldn't want your parents there. <laughs> because they'd be on stage with you. You know, it's, it's you know, I don't know. You know, as artists, and you're, you're an artist performer as well, you know, as, as a talk show host. And I think that, um, you know, we're a little bit, we're a bit of misfits, you know. We're the dark horses. We're the black sheep. And... And you know they, you don't want to offend them or, or make you want to make them right. proud. It's just a little uncomfortable to have them in the room. But the fact that they, I agree. Once they see you on TV, they went, 
I'm okay with that. <laughs> She's okay with that. That's my daughter. Right, Did right. They brag about right. You? Once you're on TV, it's fine. <laughs> okay, let's go back to beauty pageant training. Okay, yes. It really is. I mean, you're in the gym and there's a mean lady yelling at you. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. Um, oh my God, I remember this woman. She was, <sighs> and then she was like. You know, move, walk, stop, turn. I mean, it was intense. Were there a lot of you there? No, oh, yeah. The oh, Miss, I did the Miss oh, Teen oh, pageant, oh. and uh, I mean, it was like a thousand girls. They narrowed it down to thirty of us, and to twenty, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, whatever your stereotypes that you imagine are pretty much true. That's so great. The other thing um, <laughs> is, you self-proclaimed say you're a loner of a type, but look, look at you. Do you yeah. look like a loner? Maybe you're a Pisces. <laughs> Pisces no, I'm a like cancer. I, you know, I don't really know the, the American Zodiac. This is where I, and I know I talk really American, but I was bullied into speaking this way, believe me. But I'm the snake in, in the Yeah, in the you don't Chinese have an culture. accent at all. I, I can actually, I'm quite, quite versatile with my accent. When I first moved, moved here, I talked like this. Is but that how it was? No, in Singapore, they all talk like this, which is a more, more islander sound to it. Ah, so I've so. become pretty facile. Um, that way. So being a loner, how do you connect with the audience? That's the next thing. <laughs> right. No, it's true. You know, well, I, I love people and I love having this conversation, but what I mean by loner is, you know, I was brought up in a home where my parents were really solitary. My dad was a workaholic and my mom loves to garden and they're very solitary activities. And that's what I saw. Oh, so I, I, I can't go out with, with about a, 50, a party of 50 and just kind of work the room unless it's for work. But I enjoy just being by myself or, or taking a walk or I go on a vacation on my own or I went to Santa Fe, New Mexico by myself. Or, oh, you um, do? Mm -hmm. And uh, just I like one-on-one -on -one time and I like a lot of quiet time. I'm just, I'm a lot less um, social than people think. Yeah, well, you can't tell that by this. Now, the other thing is who's directing you? How can someone direct you when you know all of what's going on in what you've written? Mm, that's a good question. Well, you know, Mark St. Amant is my director. He's terrific. He's a, he's a real um, actor's director. He's done a lot of directing at the theater and the road theater. And uh, he's very type B. He's able to, and I think with a one-person show, you can't work with a type A militant director who's controlling you. Yeah. And he's very collaborative, and he's able to take a third eye point of view and see, and see what you're doing. You know, I, I mean, I'm so inside the material. That's that, what I mean. Right. He can build a set around you. And, uh, and, and, and what kind of a set do you have? You'll have to come and find out. <laughs> he has to move you around. One person has to move around that stage and keep the interest of the audience. Yes. I hope you don't fall asleep. But most of it, With the we, lighting? Does he use lighting? Oh, of course. Do you use lighting. costumes? Of course. Lighting. Now, I'm going to be on the stage naked playing the zither. No, I thought you were going to be in this <laughs> lovely old dress that you have. No. This is... <laughs> I love that. Actually, this is vintage. Oh, it's it is so, old. a very old dress. This, this old thing, this old thing uh, that I got specially for the show. But anyway, no, I'm just joking. Um, you know, what was the question? I don't remember what you were asking. Never mind. Okay. We're going to say thank you. We're going to come see Laughing. Come see it. We're going to see it. And we are you going to go back to Singapore and act? Have you thought of that? It's, uh, it's, a, different, it's a different pay scale. No. Oh. Um, <laughs> I'd rather be a smaller fish in a bigger pond than a bigger fish in a smaller pond. You would, because so you, yeah. you would be pretty well known if I'm you went back. I'm the most successful Singaporean actress in America. There's only four of us, <laughs> but I'm the most successful. Yes. Yeah, so no, no, they do. <laughs> so no, they would do you know go back? They're aware. They're aware. I would go back. You know, I would want to to be much more successful and maybe collaborate with them in something. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think I be, would want to be a work for hire. But I, but I, but I'm really proud of being from there, and I, I'd love to collaborate in some way. And that's down the, down the road, hopefully. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Don't go away. We'll be right back with director Michael Altman. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and I'm back with director, poet, Michael Altman whose show business pedigree comes from his actress mother, Lotus, and his director father, Robert. Michael has worked as an apprentice editor, assistant editor, technical supervisor, post-production supervisor, and he's worked with some, I don't know, projection equipment that I don't understand, but obviously directors like Darabont, Spielberg, and McTiernan understand it. What is that? What is that equipment? 
I, I sort of <coughs> ended up being a specialist in doing location dailies because of working for my father for setting up the uh, dailies on location. Well, what is that equipment? It's it's sounded very technical. Well, it's it's, it's technical. There's there's a it's a small handful of people that that actually do that. But we have a mobile. A, uh, projectors that are set up to take on location. We'd move into a motel room in a city and I'd take a conference room and convert it into a daily screening room for picture Oh, that's picture how you do it? Oh, do and you we actually? We would all gather around and look at the, you know, we'd, we'd sync up the dailies and, and uh, transfer the sound and, and then everybody would get together and look at what they shot the day before. Do you stay in that room or do you actually go on the set or, or how do you work with well, that equipment? Well, base camp type of, it's yeah, you know, <laughs> it's kind of a base camp operation. So, you know, I, it, it would, it would t it's a 24-hour turnaround ideally. If you can get the film out of the camera at the end of the day shooting, onto a plane, down to the lab, Back to the set, then we can check it before we break down the uh, before we break down the scene, the, the sets. And, oh, so that's you know, why. If there's a scratch on the negative, or if there's uh, some kind of a problem, you know, if, if somebody loses the the negative, there's no backup. So. Uh, so would Spielberg come in to the room and oh, yeah, watch with absolutely. you? I mean, all the so the directors have to it come depends. in. Depends. Every check. every director is different. You know, some some of them want to see more, some of them want to see less. Uh, see. Nowadays, <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty much obsolete. It's a uh, it's a thing of the past. It's all done on, uh, most film isn't even developed anymore. Uh, I was going to ask printed. you. you know, yeah. Most of the time they'll develop the negative, they'll transfer it straight to a, a digital, and then they'll output a DVD and ship it to the director, and he can look at it in his, you in know, his, in car. his suite or in his car <laughs> and his jet or whatever. And, yeah. And uh, in that point. I was going to ask you about that, but, but when you started actually working in, and as you, to work as an assistant or an apprentice editor, well, when I first started working, they were still using movieolas, and uh, and then and then we had, which is the upright, the old upright with the foot pedal and the yeah. little teeny screen. And, yeah. And, uh, so you, you know, went through the whole process. And then we we uh, kind of got modern and went to the eight plate chem where you had the big screens, and and uh, and I worked as a chem assistant for a number of years, and kind of li like lived as a editing room rat for a number of years. And but then the projection thing became a, uh, oh. a backup for me. But then how did you transfer transfer out of that projection thing into what's going on now? Oh, that's a, that's a, oh, just one morning I woke up and I just, <laughs> no, it, it was a, uh, it was a bit of a 30 year yeah. haul of doing that. So Is that what Doing that kind of work, of, you know, in post production. But there's a lot that goes on after after everybody packs up and the stars go home, there's a lot of there's about six months to a year of work that goes into post production, and I kind of lived primarily in that world for a long time. So, so you've worked with Gus Van Sant and David Lynch, who are totally different from those action directors that we talked about. Um, what were you doing with with these kind of well, artsy, artsy, more <laughs> artsy directors? The you know I facilitated them doing their jobs mostly you know I mean I would I would come out and uh, a, a drugstore cowboy I oh, supplied yeah. all the editorial equipment that they used on location so I don't think I ever saw Gus more oh. than one or a few oh, you know sorry. but uh, uh, and uh, you know I got an Emmy for doing uh, the Twin Peaks show with David Lynch but you know at, I was working with his editor primarily so it's a the very kind of a non-creative and technical thing. What? But I have seen millions and millions of miles of other people's film. But we talk about the creative part and we talk about the ooh, the movie star part and all that and, and you're showing us what really is going on. Well, this was, the, yeah, this was the work part. <laughs> but what about the work part? What about <laughs> what, growing up with your father and working with your father? That's a different story. That is was, it different? Were you on the set with him? Yeah, quite a bit. So off and on. I mean, all of my family has been involved in one way. You know, all my brothers are all in the business. My, my brother Steven's a production designer and he's a uh, very, very uh, talented guy, and my brother Bobby is a uh, is a, uh, a camera operator and uh, now a DP, and, and is working. Uh, uh, worked a very, very talented guy in his own right. And, uh, did you learn? Brother, did, 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 oh, you have another brother too. Yeah, my brother Matt works oh. in, in set design and and, and uh, um, 
uh, works with props and stuff, and we, we've all been involved in various uh, uh, areas. So. Oh, I didn't realize that. So you all learned at the really at the foot of your father in all different well, aspects of the business. Well, we didn't just <laughs> We didn't automatically get a, t a free pass. It was no, like but I mean, you, you were you working. You really had to work. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you know, um, if you didn't cut the mustard, you had to go, and you know. I went a few times. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think uh, I mentioned in the beginning that you were a poet. So there's a creative part here, and I think um, a poet can write lyrics. And I that's one of the funny stories, the mash story and the phenomenon. Yes. Tell us about that. That's hilarious. You can be funny. <laughs> <laughs> I can. Yeah, you can be funny. Uh, you know, it's a. Uh, I was 14 years old, and and uh, and my father was putting together the Nash project, and I had gone and interrupted him in one of his business meetings in the house late at night to show him some of the poetry I was writing, and and he goes, "Oh, come in here, and we're just talking about this thing. Why don't you write this song?" And I'm going, "Oh yeah, sure," <laughs> and. Uh, uh, it, it ended up it ended up working out, you know. Uh, uh, I I went. He told me this is the scene and this is the name of it, and you know we're going to call this uh, uh, "Suicide Is Painless," and it goes with this particular <laughs> right. setup. This is the setup, but we need something for them to, for the guy to play while while they're putting this this guy in the, this this painless pole, the <laughs> dentist in the, into a coffin, and he thinks he's dead, and it's supposed to be kind of a joke song and. You know, I went. Uh, I, I went over to my grandmother's. Uh, I was 13 or 13. I was just turning 14, and um, I went and wrote like 102 verses of the most atrocious crap you've ever heard in your life. You really did. It was god awful. Uh -huh. it, was, it was really embarrassing, and I took it and I tore it all up. And I went back to my dad. and I said, I can't do this. It's, you better find somebody to do it. And, and he goes, okay, fine. And about an hour later, I walked out in the backyard and I just wrote it down in about 15 minutes. But I was writing a lot of poetry at the time. I was a big Bob Dylan fan and Leonard Cohen. And oh, yes. Kinda, the boys. All, all <laughs> Donovan and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, good. And, you know, I had my psychedelic guitar. And, <laughs> and uh, it just worked out that they used it and it, it worked really well. They so. used it. And the, the irony was you made a big hit and made a lot of money. Yeah, I had no idea. They uh, <laughs> <laughs> More than your father? Mr. Preminger <laughs> set that up, but I had no idea at the time. But uh, they paid me $500 for the song, and uh, which I was thrilled with. And yeah. I went out and bought a beautiful 12-string Aria guitar, and it was just glorious. Fantastic. I, mean, I spent every penny of that on this, on this <laughs> right. great guitar. Well, you guitar. had a job, so yeah. you could spend it no, all. No, I was right. it. I mean, I figured that was the end of the story, and then... Uh, and then uh, years, as uh, as as uh, as time went on, I you know at one point I, somebody sent me a check for twenty six dollars from ASCAP, and I thought, <laughs> wow, this is great, you know, twenty six dollars. The next check was I think twenty six thousand dollars. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, I know. I had no idea. So that's what was so going great. On. And I immediately uh, set out to destroy my life and everybody else's. Uh, from that point forward, it was, t yeah, my my uh, dad was. Um, he was paid a flat fee for the film, and uh, and he worked really hard, and it was a labor of love on his part. And I basically had so little respect for the whole thing; he didn't know what I was doing. And <laughs> you made more than he did. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Okay, so now from that that phenomenon into theater directing, we've gone all through your film stuff. Now we're at the theater Exit Ten, which is written by Daniel Dean Darst. Dan, and Danny's been a friend of the family and has been uh, hanging around uh, <coughs> for, since I can remember. I've known him for probably 30 years or so. And uh, so, what's the story? Exit 10. Great title. It is, isn't it? Uh huh. It's a it's a keeper. It's a keeper. <laughs> <laughs> what is the story? Like it. It's a <coughs> it's it's a semi autobiographical confession. It's a dream. It's a it's a it's a he talks in there a lot about experiences that uh, that only he could have and uh, uh, growing up on the road and uh, and uh, he tells a little story and sings a little song and tells a little story and sings a little song and these are all songs that we've known and loved in our family for years uh -huh. he's always been a performer and uh, 
And, uh, and then it kind of, all of a sudden, you're looking at it and it turns into this flashback and we see some of the stories that he's been describing in the front of the play come to life and, and, uh, it, and there's a, it's a, just a marvelously written piece. You're working in a very small theater. Where it's not small, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's under the radar. It's a very, it's a I wonder, know the wonderful. theater. It's, it's great. Wonderful. Yeah, it's great and it has, like, you can look High from above, high down, ceilings, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a marvelous venue. We love it. And I had seen a friend of mine, Ronnie Marmo, runs Theater 68. It's on, uh, uh, on Sunset. We Hollywood. love Ronnie Marmo. He's he was a, a guest on our show. He's a wonderful guy. He's yeah. a dear friend of mine. I've known Is him for he? years. Yes. You're, oh, that's years why years. you're there. No, I'm th I'm, that's not why I'm there. Okay. I'm there because I went to go see a production that he had done uh, several years ago. A number. It, it's been there for like 12 years. And I, I knew immediately. I've had this project. Danny let me read this back in, I think, 95. Oh, so you've been working and I on had, it. And the first time I read it, I knew that it was like something really exceptional. And the first time I went and saw one of, a play in Ronnie's Theater there, uh, in Theater 68, I knew it was, uh, that that's where I wanted to do this. And I brought Danny into town and I sat him down in there and he went, you know, this is it. Like it's the very theater? intimate. You know, it's not a, you know, I'd, I'd like to take this to, a, you know, another venue, a larger stage, and I'd like to see it somewhere else, but I, I would not, I, I wouldn't have launched it anywhere else. That's what I, one of the questions I was going to ask you, does this go on to a, like, to Absolutely. back to New York? Does Absolutely. it become a film? We what does it New York, become? We, no, it'll never be a film. It'll it's never not be. a film. It's a, it's a piece of theater, and it's... And you of, know that, it's because... A piece of, it's a piece of live theater. <laughs> I would love to do a film. I'm not doing this. This is not a... I see. It's not a film. It's, I see. This is a piece of work as it is. It's a, it's a very smart, very tightly written... Uh, uh, piece and it's do it's to be done live and that's it that's it and uh, uh -huh. it'll never translate to film could it be acted by anyone else but Danny Tom Waits I want Tom oh. <laughs> I want Tom to do uh, uh, he, he he doesn't know it yet but I'm gonna go and so when you take it on the road you could have different uh, performers absolutely. in all different absolutely. places absolutely it's 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 so well written and it's such a smart piece and it really is it's a uh, it seems all it seems very random and kind of like rambling uh, as you start out but uh, by the time you get to the end of it, every single layer that's been laid down is just stacks. So and that's it creates a complete piece of work that's just, it's phenomenal. That's what a director has to do and has to understand. And as you say, you've been working on it so you really understand it. Because I've I heard this. your I've directing is like choreography. It, it, it's, it's beautiful. A, it's a very well engineered piece, and uh, uh, because I'm engineering it well. That's what I mean. No, <laughs> but, that's what I heard. But, okay. but it needs to be. We're going It really needs to be. We're gonna go see Exit Ten, it's and I'm, we, we hope it's all over the U.S. and in Europe, travel. so we can see it other places. And I thank you so much for coming today. Thanks so much for your time. Keep writing, J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com and 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor. See you next time.